about uh, Mexican uh, permanent residents being, quote, unlikely uh, to become uh, citizens. Uh, and, uh, kind of <laughs> so we have these upward trends in citizenship and voting, but still the persistent underrepresentation, dramatic underrepresentation of Latino citizens, both immigrant and, and U.S. born. And it, it's remarkable how little research energy, whether academic or practitioner, led is really being invested in trying to get a better handle on understanding the nature of this, this lag. We saw Marcelo's data and how to close that gap. And the real experts in the room are, some of them are in the room, and your colleagues back home. Uh, and unfortunately, the, uh, I think uh, we need, need to do a better job of convincing uh, those who allocate research energy to pay more attention to this issue so you have more tools to, to work with. Second uh, cross-cutting issue is that 2006 showed us just how dramatically immigrants were able to respond en masse, to engage in public action in specific political moments that, again, in contrast to something we heard this morning, English is actually not necessarily a prerequisite for civicness. Uh, but sustained action and fuller representation and actual impact on the powers that be does require a level of civic support infrastructure it has two principal constraints. One, it's very unevenly distributed. And it's in very limited even in, as we were hearing in a very interesting way today from LA, even in, in apparently densely organized cities, uh, it's still uh, a far cry from what would need to be, need to, to, to increase the number of digits of people, <laughs> right? From the thousands to the tens of thousands to the hundreds of thousands, even in LA. Uh, and so that's a really important reality check. Uh, this unevenness, and then even where <clears throat> where it's we've been doing it for 20 years, the, the the difficult path to expanding that impact. Third cross-cutting issue is that one way to think about the post-06 trends is through the Latin American lens of from protest to proposal. And as Gaspar indicated, it's easier to mobilize resistance to a threat than to make something new and positive happen. And so it's not a coincidence that the immigrant rights protests of 06 could block the Stenson-Brenner bill, but comparative immigration reform remains basically stalemated, at least so far. And put another way, it's, it's easier to agree on what we're against than what we're for. And this, as we heard earlier, has affected coalition dynamics in the future, in some, in some cities rather, and it that probably will continue as tough choices are, are being made, as we heard uh, in this morning's panel. The, uh, the way in which the enforcement frame is dominating uh, the discussion in the narrowly defined political arena, uh, you all know much better than I how that is going to play out at the grassroots level where that uh, frame is, is simply unacceptable uh, to so many of our uh, friends and, and partners. So we, we need to get ready for some, for some friction uh, in, in the next uh, few months, I think. Uh, Fourth and last uh, cross-cutting issue, and at the risk of stating, this may be completely obvious, uh, but it's worth keeping in mind that the relationship between immigrant civic and political engagement participation, on the one hand, and comprehensive immigration reform is, poses a basic chicken and egg problem. Chicken and egg, which comes first. The challenge cuts both ways, in other words. How, without one, how do you get the other? That's what one way to think about uh, the work that, that uh, folks in the room are doing. In, in other words, as we get more of one, we can get more of the other. As, as we don't get more of one, we don't get more of the other. And so the, there's a reason why it's so hard. This is, a, this is either a vicious circle or a virtuous circle. And turning a vicious circle that we've inherited into a vir virtuous circle where it goes from downward spiral to upward spiral, that's, that's one way to frame the the challenge. And, and a, a specific key question here for the next phase in the debate nationally is, is, is how to crack this vicious circle specifically in congressional swing districts. Uh, and this really poses a special channel, challenge for those in the room who, uh, who are working in areas of newer settlement where on the one hand you, you may feel like you have less political clout than folks in traditional gateway cities, but the folks in the traditional gateway cities already usually have their congressional representatives voting the right way and working hard. So those of you who feel like you're, you're, you're you know, out there, isolated, vulnerable, you actually have potentially more power because the congressional vote you are, could influence even a little bit matters more. It's not already in the bag. So good luck. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to just, again, like I said, I was going to respect the time, and I just want to conclude by thanking everyone here for contributing to this ongoing process of reflection about how immigrants are claiming Americanness and in the process transforming it. And I'm going to turn to one of our uh, long-term partners in this project and also the lead partner on the city-based uh, forum in LA, Gaspar Rivera, for some final reflections before Sol Bada shares some words about getting to, to closure on this phase of our project. So thanks very much to all of you for sharing your experiences today. Likewise, like Jonathan, I'm really pleased to have participated in this uh, event because I think uh, for me there is a great lesson in comparisons. And I think I want to uh, uh, underline two main uh, takeaway messages that I think uh, everybody shared with us in this room. One is the importance of comparison, and the other one is the Latino paradox that we're describing. In terms of the, uh, the importance of comparison, um, uh, all throughout this day, I've been thinking about another meeting that I recently attended with Andrew Silly, which was a meeting on immigration in Spain, in Europe. And, and, and just hearing everybody talking about, yes, how hard it is, our work here in the United States, how, how, di uh, how different history marches in different places, Nevada, uh, in the Midwest, uh, just thinking about all the wonderful things that are happening in the gateway cities, there is an underlining hope. I think here we're talking about what are the ways in which we're going to become more uh, empowered in the political system? And what are the, the you know, like Angelica said, what is the American, American way to do in politics? And, 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 and sort of taking, you know, talking about the great advances that Latinos have done in, 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 in American politics. Because I was, I was thinking about the other meeting because to them, when I was describing the, the experience of Los Angeles, the fact that we have a Latino mayor, the, the fact that uh, the past uh, uh, speaker of the House uh, uh, of the Assembly, Fabian Nunez, was an immigrant, you know, youth, especially youth in, in, in Barcelona, were very surprised because they said this would never happen in Europe. You know, the sun of immigrants becoming a major of uh, a big city. And, 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 it just, and, it just, and also the, the conference in Spain talk about the challenge, we talk about the challenge of, of, um, of immigrants and the religion and Muslims coming to Europe and oh my gosh, you know, they do have a challenge. And, and I think that for me, just being in this room and having a bird's eye view of what's happening throughout the country, what are the different challenges, I think is very inspiring. But also, uh, we have identified some of the main challenges that we have. So for example, and this leads me to the Latino paradox. Um, uh, we've been talking about Latinos and immigration, and we have used even the terms that we use to refer to this population. We, have, we go back and forth between Latino, Hispanic, Mexicano, Central American. Uh, in a way, we are in the process of forging a, a Latino, a, 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 a larger pan-ethnic uh, uh, political identity. And I think that is still emerging. I mean, in Los Angeles, it's very interesting when we talk about the, the generational divide, right? I mean, the politics of immigrants versus the, the Mexican-American, the Chicano politics, especially in LA, you know, one of the places where the Chicano movement took place. I mean, uh, we are very aware of the uh, uh, not only generational, uh, 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 you know, connections, but also the 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 disencounters between generations. Uh, I do a lot of work with uh, Mexican immigrant organization and Central American immigrant organi uh, organizations, and it's very hard for them to find a pan-ethnic identity. We have many um, uh, immigrant, uh, Mexican immigrant-led organizations that have formed around, you know, federations of specific states. We have indigenous migrants. Uh, there have been recently some attempts to form pan-Mexican uh, immigrant-led organizations, but as it's still, you know, it's still happening. It's not there yet. Uh, the same with Central Americans. So I think one of the big challenges is. Um, this process uh, of action, of political action by which we're forging 
a political identity. And I think that's, uh, <coughs> that's very complicated. How are we going to organize these people in the current paradigm of identity politics in the United States, where we have, you know, when we talk about uh, multi -et a multi-ethnic society, a multi-ethnic diversity, and each different culture in these uh, diverse mosaic of cultures, each, each uh, different ethnic identity or each different nationality have a, has a little square in this large mosaic. So who represents the Latinos? Who represents the Mexicans? And I think we need to pay a lot of attention to that process in terms of shaping our message, in terms of moving forward, but also to understand the concerns. The other, the other uh, question of the Latino paradox is how we want to have it both ways. On the one hand, we want to be successful in, uh, in being equal uh, in American politics, but also uh, in terms of what, of what Oscar was saying, you know, we want to have the right to be also different, to be connected to our homelands. And how that's playing out in American politics, I think, is a challenge when you have a population that is very much an immigrant population, very much connected to their home uh, communities, very much developing a political identity connected to those uh, communities of origin. But also, on the other hand, the majority of Latinos in the U.S. are um, native-born. No longer the Latino population is a foreign-born population. It is actually native-born. So, so that second generation, I think, and we need to pay a lot of attention to, to that second generation, the, uh, the ones that are up and coming. And how we start um, addressing the issues of uh, intergenerational historical memory, really uh, uh, if history uh, marches in diff at different paces in different uh, uh, regions, how can we systematize the learned experience? How can we systematize the knowledge that we have so that uh, we push history even a little faster. So I think there's, um, yes, there's a lot of work to do, but also we have to look back and look at everything that we've done and, and sort of uh, uh, save those lessons. Uh, uh, and I think in forging our agenda forward, also think about uh, um, how we're building this new political identity, and I think it's going to be crucial to, for, for politicians to understand this and for us also to be conscious of that. So thank you. Thank you very much for being here. And I just want to close by reiterating the message of what we have done so far as the Latino immigrant movement. And I want to say once again um, uh, what ha has happened between Proposition 187, which, as you know, was very difficult for immigrants in, in California in 94, and then the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immig Immigrant Responsibility Act of 1996. Those are two important points that have really demonstrated the capacity for organizing for immigrants because Angelica was saying that she thinks that between 94 and 96 is a turning point for immigrant organizations and it might have to do as a reaction of these ba very bad laws that were implemented against immigrants. So from from that point, I just want to uh, recap with something that really concerned me this morning when uh, the first panel were telling again the same narrative that Mexican immigrants are not naturalizing. Mexican immigrants are very unlikely to do that. So I don't want to look at it in these like uh, short span numbers from 2007 or 2006, but I want to tr try to share with you a little bit of a larger picture. So in 1995, only 20 percent of eligible Mexican immigrants had become citizens. But that rate rose 50 percentage points by 2005. And between 1995 and 2005, the share of Mexicans who naturalized rose 75 percent compared to 20 percent increase for all other groups. And finally, now if you want to check what it means in absolute numbers, by 2008, two million eligible Mexicans had acquired U.S. citizenship while 2.5 million remain as LPRs. So we have this challenge now. We need to do something so that these 2.5 legal permanent residents who as of now are eligible to naturalize need to, like, um, how we can create these strategies to come up with a new effort for doing more English as a second language, more citizenship classes, and then we talk about resources. There are lo we learned today that there are limited resources. And then the second takeaway message I want you to, to, to take with you to your cities is that uh, there is uh, unevenness of resources at the local and at the state level. 
Today we heard about these amazing stories of Illinois with the New Americans Initiative and all these efforts that also in California have been doing. But uh, we also learned that in California there are $3 million invested every year for citizenship. And you have a lot more immigrants in California than you have in Illinois. And Illinois is investing the same amount of money every year but with the state funds. We also learned of the experience of Little Town, Colorado, that the major, uh, the L League of um, Municipal Action was uh, sharing with us in some cases, like some years back in Indianapolis. But other than that, I don't know if we could say that this is a constant trend, that the local governments or state governments are really doing something to integrate immigrants that are legal permanent residents residents or they have or they are new citizens so what else can be done on that uh, sector in um, in the third <coughs> issue we still need to know more about is how to create to create um, uh, stronger alliances in coalition among the most important actors uh, uh, so that um, labor unions faith-based initiatives worker centers day laborers Spanish language media new youth um, mobilizations among immigrant Latinos um, how they can come together in meaningful and stronger alliances. And also, we also learned that the political parties, both the Democrats and the Republicans, need to do a lot more to reach out to Latino immigrant voters. And they need to create new innovative strategies and knock out at their doors because the old political messages that uh, might be useful for white voters are not, this, are not as effective for um, Spanish dominant Latino immigrants. So the political parties need to understand that. And then um, I will leave it here, and I want to share with you that our next steps are to produce a national report where we plan to synthesize all that we've been doing in the last two years in the nine cities where we conducted community dialogues, and you have some of the reports ready outside if you want to take some with you. Some others are still coming. They are in press. Um, so the next few months, we're going to devote ourselves to Jonathan, Gaspar, Andrew, and myself trying to write um, the synthesis of what we've learned from you uh, through in these last two years, and especially what we learned today. So if you are so kind to share with us some feedback or li like send us more comments or an evaluation of what were the lessons that you learned today or some feedback that you can tell us in the next few uh, few months please uh, we will appreciate if you can send us an email or write a short comments about this program today because we would like to incorporate all your ideas for having a very uh, like an, an enriched um, essay or text that we're going to produce in the in the next two months so I don't know if you uh, Jonathan Andrew or Gaspar want to add some something else that you think are missing uh, we missed Andrew We'll give the last word to our host. Yes. <laughs> the last word is thank you so much for everyone who took the time to travel, took the day off from work. If you're local, um, thank you for being here. Thanks to all of our panelists who shared their thoughts, and we look forward to, to staying in touch and any comments that, that you want to share that could be inform the final products that come out of this project. Thanks so much. Thank you.